It's been in the mid to high 90s here in Middle Tennessee for the last several weeks. So what better time than now to talk about heat related emergencies and heat illness. All right, so before we get going, we would really appreciate it if you left us a like, if you find some valuable information in this video. If you have any questions over the stuff we're going over, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a comment down below. And make sure you hit the subscribe button over there and turn your notifications on so you're alerted when we post any future content. All right, so let's talk about some heat-related emergencies and heat illness. There are three different types of heat-related emergencies that we're gonna to discuss today. We have heat cramps, we have heat exhaustion, and then we have heat stroke on the far end of the spectrum. So let's start out simple. When we are out working in the heat, one, we all know this, but here's a quick reminder. We should be drinking a lot of water, staying hydrated um, because we are sweating and losing water quickly. Uh, so we need to make sure we stay hydrated. We wanna make sure that we are keeping electrolytes in our system. And I'm not talking about downing a bunch of sugary Gatorade. A lot of people say if you are using Gatorade, you really should be diluting that down Gatorade has a ton of sugar in it. So while that can be good on some fronts, you don't wanna be just constantly putting a ton of sugar in your system um, while you're just trying to get those electrolytes. There's a couple other sports drinks uh, out there that will help rehydrate you quickly, uh, like Liquid IV and Drip Drop. Those are both ones that are put out there for athletes and first responders. You can add that to water. It gives you the electrolytes, but doesn't have near the sugar in it. But you should be hydrating with water, but you also need to make sure you're getting electrolytes as well. Prevention is the best treatment for an illness. If we can prevent that in the first place, we never have to deal with that. So let's make sure that we are monitoring our heat levels, monitoring our intake of fluids, um, and make sure that we're staying aware of these signs and symptoms uh, before they actually become a big deal. All right, so let's move into heat cramps. So heat cramps are muscle cramps that you will get from dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Any time that we sweat or we uh, pee off extra water that we've been drinking, sodium moves with that water always. Other electrolytes move with that as well, but particularly sodium. That's why you'll get salt stains on your shirt when you're sweating a lot. Um, so we can have low sodium in our body if we are losing a lot of fluid. That's why we have to make sure we have some electrolytes that we are replacing in our body rather than just plain water over and over and over again. So to prevent heat cramps, we wanna make sure we're drinking lots of water and we have uh, some type of electrolyte going in our system. If you do have heat cramps, start hydrating. You also want to uh, start working. You can massage those muscles, massage those cramps, stretch those uh, to try to relieve any of the spasms um, and try to provide a little bit of relief from those cramps. But ultimately, rehydrating and adding some electrolytes back into your system are gonna be one of the keys there to help relieve that cramp and also prevent any future ones while you're continuing to work. All right, as we progress to the next level, we're now talking about heat exhaustion. So heat exhaustion, we've been outside working in the heat. We are getting hot, our core temperature is starting to rise a bit. Um, we're continuing to get dehydrated. So again, make sure you're staying on top of those fluids. Uh, make sure you're staying on top of those electrolytes and monitor how your body reacts to the environment. If you start getting too hot um, or someone else you realize around you is getting too hot, make sure that you're cooling down and that you're allowing your body to get rid of that heat. The creator designed our bodies to be able to adapt to environments around us fairly well. So when we're out in the heat, if we're used to sitting in the AC all day, our body is not gonna like that heat. If we're used to working in the heat, our body is much more readily able to adapt to that heat and we don't have near as many issues uh, from that heat. So understand your body, understand how these signs and symptoms are showing up on you or people around you. And as always, get out of the heat for a little while, sit in the shade, get in the AC for a little while if you are not adapting well to that environment you're working in. Normal signs and symptoms for heat exhaustion would be uh, dizziness, a little bit of lethargy, um, kind of tired, drowsy, feel like they might pass out. It's not a heat stroke yet, um, but we do have the body trying to compensate rapidly for this heat, trying to give, get rid of this heat, but it can't get rid of the heat at the level that is actually holding on to the heat. So we wanna make sure that we cool these patients down before this does become the next level, uh, which is a heat stroke. As we are trying to cool these patients with heat exhaustion, um, a good 
rule of thumb is to try to cool where the large arteries run. So we could put ice packs to the neck, uh, to the groin, um, up under the arms, any part where those arteries are gonna be flowing, uh, we can start to cool that blood down a little bit uh, by putting ice packs in some of those areas. You also have a lot of heat loss through your head. So pouring some cool water on your head um, or pour, putting a cold rag, wet rag that's been dipped in cold water on your head, that can help draw some of that heat out as well and be able to bring your body temperature back down. All right, so let's jump into heat stroke. So heat stroke is definitely the worst of these three illnesses we're talking about. And a heat stroke is not a stroke like a normal stroke where we have some ischemia in one part of the brain, uh, somebody's not able to move one side, facial droop. A lot of times in heat stroke, we will actually have a person that's completely unresponsive or is really just not acting right. So two criteria to be able to call this heat stroke. One, it either has to be a core temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, or the person has to have altered mental status from the heat. So if someone is now confused and is not able to think properly, they don't know exactly where they are, they're not making a lot of sense, they might start appearing drunk or impaired, if that is due to the heat illness, now we can start calling that heat stroke, and now we really need to start working on cooling these patients down quickly because their body's basically cooking on the inside and we've got to cool that down to prevent any uh, permanent damage to their brain, any permanent damage to the body. These patients need to get cooled down quickly. Before we get into the treatment for heat stroke, let's talk for a minute about the two different types of heat stroke that we have. We have a classic heat stroke and we have an exertional heat stroke. The classic is just when somebody's core temperature starts rising and they cannot get rid of that heat fast enough. An exertional heat stroke is somewhat the same thing, but it's because of intense exercise and that is usually in the heat, but now they're exercising. So they are producing a lot of extra heat on top of the hot environment that they're already in. Now our body, whenever we exercise, we work hard, we give off heat that's normal, but our body has ways of getting rid of that heat. One, it will circulate that through the blood. It's kind of like a radiator in a car where we're circulating that heat out to the periphery. We start opening up the blood vessels in our arms. It's called vasodilation. And now all we've increased the surface area on those vessels that are down in our periphery. So our legs, arms, um, anything near the surface of the skin. Those vessels dilate and now we have more blood that's flowing near the surface to be able to expel that heat. That's one reason why if you go from a cold environment out to a hot environment and now you're working out and uh, you're trying to release that heat, you can get a little bit dizzy um, and you can start to feel like you're gonna pass out and you may even pass out um, because you quickly have that body is opening up those vessels and opening up that container. Your blood pressure may drop due to that and you can start to have some syncopal um, episodes from that. So that's one thing to watch out for. Um, your body is naturally responding to the heat, but now you may have a lower blood pressure from the body trying to open up these vessels to get rid of the massive amount of heat that your body is producing. Again, your body will adapt to this heat over time. So if you out, are outside working construction in the heat all day, your body adapts to this on a regular basis. Same thing with athletes. Athletes that are training in these environments, their body builds up resistance and they are a lot better suited to be in those environments exercising. But if you take somebody from a cold climate or somebody that's not used to being in the heat and now they're exerting themselves and working out in the heat, that's gonna be one of those times where we may see this a lot more commonly. So if your body's already acclimated to this heat and to this exercise, it's not this heat stroke is not gonna be near as common. Another way that our body works on getting rid of heat is through sweating. So we have an evaporative process of having sweat on our body and it evaporates to the atmosphere. And with that, it pulls heat out of our body and releases that into the surrounding around us. Now, if we have high humidity outside, we're gonna have difficulty with our body actually releasing that sweat into that humidity. So that's why people say it's a dry heat. Well, that's because their sweat is actually evaporating faster and pulling some of that heat out. Um, as we have a very humid environment, like we do here in Middle Tennessee, our sweat does not evaporate as quickly, it lingers with us, and so we don't have as much of that evaporative cooling, and so we're not able to give off or get rid of that heat that's in our body quite as fast. All right, so we have someone with exertional heat stroke. 
They have been exercising and producing heat internally. It's hot outside. They cannot get rid of the heat inside their body fast enough to keep up with the demands and the heat that they are actually producing by doing this exercise. Their core temperature elevates over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. They start to get altered mental and then maybe eventually they will even go completely unresponsive. They may be laying on the ground and they are in desperate need of some immediate emergency care. So what are we going to do for these patients? Well, the first thing we really need to do with these patients after we have determined that yes, this is related to the heat and it's not because of blood loss or some other trauma or they hit their head, but if we know this, this is related to the heat, we can start cooling them immediately. We're not going to uh, want to spend a ton of time doing crazy assessments and everything. We need to get their core temperature down. That is the main thing for them. So how are we gonna bring their core temperature down? Well, if we start cooling the extremities, we're gonna shrink those blood vessels down, we're gonna restrict blood flow, and then we're not gonna have good circulation to be able to uh, circulate that blood and continue to give off that heat. So pouring cold water or putting ice all over the arms by itself is not the best route to go. So a lot of people say you could take ice packs and you stick it in the neck, the groin, armpit, um, those areas. And then if you have a medic on scene, you can start an IV and give some cold fluids as well to circulate through the body. Well, one of the problems with ice packs is ice packs don't stay cold for very long. And it's not a lot of surface area when we're talking about how much surface area there is on a body. So if we just throw ice packs in those areas, we're not gonna pull enough heat out fast enough to bring this core temperature down to where it needs to be. So the best way that we can bring this body temperature down in an efficient manner is to submerge the core of the body down in some cold water, ice water, cold creek water, something to be able to pull that heat out of the body. If you have a creek nearby, drag this patient down into the creek, keep their head above water obviously, but let their body sit down in that cool creek water and keep them there until that body temperature comes back down uh, to a normal level. A normal core temperature that we're looking at to bring this patient down to, to make sure that we don't go too far the other way and actually give them hypothermia, that'd be about 101 to 102 Fahrenheit. That's the temperature we're aiming for to make sure that we don't go too far the other way and make them too cold. Now, when I'm talking about a core temperature, typically that is a rectal temperature. That's the, about the only way you're gonna get a true core temperature. So this may not be something that you're doing um, yourself uh, before professional services get there or before, before they get to a hospital. You may not have the tools to do this, um, but just understand we're talking core temperature. That's what we're talking about. If you take a temperature under the arm or on the forehead, that's not gonna be as accurate as a true core temperature. All right. Let's say that this same scenario happened, but we're not near a creek. Let's say this happened while we are um, out at a gathering with friends and family, or we're at a sporting event, or let's say that we are uh, running some drills with our friends at the range and something happens. So we have someone that we have to cool down. We can use what's called the TACO method. This is the TARP assisted cooling with oscillation. Now what this is, is we use a tarp, we lay it out. We put our patient in the middle of the tarp and we roll the sides of the tarp up around the patient. We hold the sides of the tarp up around the patient to make a little bit of a bowl for this patient. And now we can use any coolers of ice and water that we have, throw that in there with the patient, again, making sure to keep their head above water. And then we will use this bowl that we've made now um, to help hold that water around the patient's core to try to bring that temperature down. The last part of the taco is the oscillation. In order to speed this process up, the more that we can move this cold water around the body and to be able to pull that heat off the body, the faster we can cool this patient down. So now as we slosh this water back and forth over the patient, that will start to cool them down quickly. After you've cooled that patient down, now is the time to back up and do a full assessment airway, breathing, circulation, go into a full head to toe assessment. Let's get blood pressure. Let's do a full set of vitals, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, respiratory rate. Let's look at pupils. Let's see if they're sluggish. Let's do a full trauma assessment to make sure that there's not another secondary injury that we're missing second to this heat injury that we've already treated. All right, let's do a quick recap. So we have three types of heat related emergencies. We have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat stroke is obviously the worst of these, and that is when our core temperature is either at 104 Fahrenheit or 
we have heat-related illness that has now led to altered mental status. At that point, we can call that heat stroke and we need to start cooling this patient as fast as possible. Submerge the core in cold water or ice water. Use the taco method if you don't have a basin or a creek nearby that you can put this patient in get that core temperature down, and then do a full assessment on this patient. Remember that prevention is much easier than treatment here. So if we can make sure that we're properly hydrated, that we have good intake of electrolytes, and that we are monitoring our signs and symptoms and getting out of the heat if we start having some of these uh, symptoms like dizziness, um, lethargy, and some of these signs of heat exhaustion, maybe even heat cramps, we start assessing and uh, taking care of that now before it progresses all the way to a heat stroke. So let's make sure we're good on prevention, watch over one another out there in this crazy heat, and as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.